a bright Sunday morning in June in London. Tower Bridge is solid with cars. Not an unusual sight, except that these cars are a little out of the ordinary, and they're just about to set off on the Sunday outing of a lifetime. A hundred cherished survivors from a time when motoring was a pleasure. Remember when motoring was a pleasure, when AA men saluted, petrol was half a crown a gallon, and the nearest traffic jam was more than a hundred yards away? Ah, oh, well. These lovingly matured motors are about to compete in Europe's longest classic car rally ever, the Pirelli Classic Marathon. There are entrants from eight countries, including Holland. This 1952 MG nearly didn't make it. A piston broke on the way to London, and they spent all night replacing it. There are ordinary motorists like you and me, and there are rally stars from the golden age of motoring. Han Hall, for instance. We'll just have a look at the tyres before we She's start. generally recognised as one of the world's greatest women rally drivers of all time. And Bill Bengry, who drove this Ford Cortina in 1968 in the London to Sydney Marathon. <laughs> the purpose of this whole jamboree is to celebrate one simple fact. Old cars are more fun than new ones. There's an incentive too, an Alpine Cup. Anyone who can meet all the target times over the 2,500 mile course will get one. For the dedicated car spotter, there are 60 different types to name. The 1934 Lagonda is the oldest car in the rally in its British racing green and Union Jack, and owned, as it happens, by a Dutchman. Motoring history is recalled by great names, some of them lost forever. The marathon is designed to give these enthusiasts a taste of the rally routes their own cars might have competed over when they were new. Reims, once the home of the French Grand Prix. Et Les Bains, traditionally one of the gathering points for the Monte Carlo rally. Milan and Monza for the modern Grand Prix circuit. Then through some of the most beautiful landscapes in Europe, the Alps and Cortina. Ah, Cortina. Any surviving cars then attempt the 9,000-foot Stelvio Pass into Switzerland. Then it's back to London for the finish and the prize giving. The seven days will be punctuated with tests of driving skill and all-out rally stages against the clock. The organizers want it to be just like an authentic rally. And these people are serious. Is that any way to treat a precious old Alvis? indeed a 1950s Jowett Jupiter. It is if you want to win a prize. This is a timed test round a slalom course at Lydon Airfield near Dover. And that's Berto Mandelli in his Lancia Flavia Zagato. And how about this E-Type Jaguar? Henry Pierman owns a garage, and who said just as well? Ah, oh, the Cortina with Bill Bengry and his co-driver Ralph Stokes. Ralph is in his 80s and drove in his first Monte Carlo rally 50 years ago. The 1950 Healy Silverstone was designed by Donald Healy before his long collaboration with Austin. Yes, it is, a Ford Anglia under the direction of two heroines of many rallies of the 1960s, Anne Hall and Val Morley. They have their sights firmly set on one of the Alpine Cups. Enjoyed the uh, Lydon test, but I had to be a little careful because my son visited me last night, and he loves me very much. And he said, "Mum, you can, you're crazy, of course, going on this rally, but you can have a try on one test. But remember, you're the only one I have left, so don't try on any more. So if they're all a bit slower from now on, you've my son to blame, not the car, not me." And uh, he told me to make sure you went nice and steady. <laughs> 
The ferry crossing is a brief opportunity for rally crews to get together and talk about, well, what do you think they're going to talk about? They are, after all, car crazy. Uh, it was very nice to go back in a big Zephyr after so many years because I drove on the um, Alpine, uh, on the Tule Rally, I'm sorry, but it had triple carburetors and so on. But even so, this is a great car and I'm very glad to be able to go with Roy on it. Yeah. And it you feels just, just right in it somehow. Oh, yes. And it's rallying in style. You've got somewhere to put your luggage. It's not like these little sports cars with baggage strapped on the back. Thank, thanks very much, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> we may not be a little sports car, but we haven't got much space, certainly. I think the cars have lasted better than some of the drivers, actually. <laughs> I'm not looking at you, I'm thinking of me. <laughs> some teams are rekindling a style of motoring which is all but forgotten. While some are highly competitive and going for an overall win, others will settle for minimum time penalties and a chance of an Alpine Cup. There's no handicapping, so the biggest and fastest will probably win. Really the only important thing for these beloved beauties from the days of happy motoring are to get through the traffic jams, survive the alpine passes which can kill a set of brakes in an hour, get to the checkpoints on time and of course keep the car in one piece and stay calm. Well where's the rest of the tools? It wasn't in the toolbox. Have well, we got some... Oh, shit. This first stretch of France is long and tiring, so the organisers have thoughtfully put the first overnight halt in the heart of Champagne country. The rallying hasn't really started yet, but even so, at the end of day one, five cars have failed to make it even this far. <coughs> Once the formalities are completed for the day, there's a short time sprint on foot to where the social events of the evening begin. Next day, the unchanging, gentle pattern of life goes on. The vines are checked and tended the way they've always been. Nothing disturbs the peace and stillness as the champagne grapes mature. Nothing, that is, unless there happens to be a classic car rally going on. This XK120 completed the Alpine rally 37 years ago and is still going strong. The AC Cobra of Atkins and Lyle is leading at the moment. It's the most powerful car in the rally. Driving on the left's okay, by the way, because they've closed the road. There's a Ford Zephyr, Sutcliffe and Dixon in command. And a Morris 1800, the actual car in which Paddy Hopker came second in the London to Sydney Marathon. The Lagonda is about to retire with its engine bearings wrecked. Astonishingly, the owner is to dash home, pick up another of his cars, an Alvis, and try to rejoin the rally, but they won't let him. The HRG of Tim Jackson stops shows no sign of living up to his name. And there's the Anglia powering through the stage, beautifully driven by Anne Hall, with total disregard for her son's instructions to drive slowly. It's normally pretty quiet round here, so this invasion has set the official nerve ends twitching. And it's brought the locals out in force. What they're seeing flash before their eyes is the history of European motor competition. They probably know as much about driving fast on these roads as anyone in the rally. The Mini was the car of the 60s. It won the Monte Carlo Rally three times. Eric Carlson seemed to be unbeatable in the days of the old two-stroke Saab. He's not driving this one. So the climb through the vineyards comes to an end. Yeah. 
Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, over here. And inevitably, driving old cars like that can damage them. Jeremy Crowley's Lotus Cortina has broken steering, but the organizers have come prepared, and there are plenty of people willing to help. In this case, the job is taking too long, and Jeremy will have to bid farewell to his chance of an Alpine Cup. Some cars and their handlers are finding it a real tussle just keeping up with the event. But the former British rally champion Bill Bengry seems confident enough. Compared with some of the serious rallies he's won, even this must seem easy. The rally has reached one of its great sentimental landmarks, the old Grand Prix circuit outside Reims. The pits are still there, the control tower, the stands. The faded buildings still seem to echo the great greasy overall tradition of motor racing when heroes were a little rough around the edges and triumph was often tempered by tragedy. To our marathon drivers, motor racing has never had quite the atmosphere it did in the heroic era of Juan Fangio, Mike Hawthorne and Sterling Moss. Safety was hardly an issue then, no seat belts or automatic fire extinguishers, and they were visible heroes, humans with faces and arms. The combat wheel to wheel was out in the open. mood must be catching. On the road south to the Alps, John Chatham's determined to put his Austin Healy through its paces. Bourget is a welcome sight at the end of a long, hot day's driving. It means the rally has reached Ailey Bam, which used to be at the traditional gathering point for the treacherous climbs into the Alps on the Monte Carlo Rally. Mont Rivard was the dreaded special stage. Five miles of gut-wrenching hairpins for the Sunbeam Rapiers, the Triumph TR3s, and the Ford Zephyrs of the 1960s. It's not that much easier in daylight and in the summer. Mike and Gina Barker's Jaguar leads the way, hotly pursued by the Healy of Don Griffiths and Bob Garside. They're no match for the AC Cobra, still the fastest car of the event. Sterling Moss won three Alpine Cups in succession in a Sunbeam Alpine just like this. David Harris and Arthur Gibson opt for a sedate style, more in keeping with the car's age. Mini drivers don't change, and the rally rules do say the co-driver has to have his own horn button. There's even a prize in this rally for the best dressed team. <laughs> Among the spectators, one of Britain's most successful rally teams ever, the twins Don and Earl Morley. They had to earn a living from their farm, but once harvest was out of the way, they were a force to be reckoned with. Well, this climb reminds one very much of the uh, Alpine rallies. Uh, which were very, very fast and furious. I can remember going through a set, set of tyres, and uh, didn't we go through a set of brake pads in two hours as well? Something on this like sort that. of This sort of going. The worst thing about it was the noise and talking to one another. Because we were on pace notes and with practised hills, uh, we had to have in intercom built into the crash helmets. 
it, it, it was in fact the heat as much as the noise that was the problem. Um, with those Heelys, uh, the floors got as hot as anything from the exhaust system. And uh, I remember on one occasion, and don't you remember, Al, that you had blisters on your feet with the exhausts were just under the passenger floor. And, uh, you know, it was very, very hot indeed. Today, on the same stage, Mike Sutcliffe and Roy Dixon are still battling on in their Zephyr. Mike won a real Alpine Cup back in 1962, on that occasion in a triumph. Sutcliffe and Dixon have the oldest conversation in rallying. Where am I going now? Uh, Even when they get there, they can't finish the stage because of one of rallying's oldest hazards. This hairpin or not? Yes. Hairpin right. Oh! God, he's handling it. Oh, off! He's taking his wheels off. Come on, you babe. Roy Dixon's at the wheel of the Zephyr when a mere Volvo 544 dares to overtake with John Handley driving it. He was saloon racing champion in the 1960s. The temptation for a test of nerve is too much to resist. There's another hairpin now. Oh, if we can get the revs, we're all right, mate. Don't let me lift. Yeah, oh, no. Don't lose it. Yeah, no. If we keep out of the bloody deep ones, it's a nuisance. If you use all the 6,000 revs, you can keep the power on quite. She sounds as though she's... There we are. There we are, we've got him now. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on, you beast. Come on. Nothing. Work. I think you'll get him on the Stelvio, Mike, if you, if you use all the revs. And so, over the pass to the frontier. The French customs at this tiny outpost respond to the invasion of a hundred elderly cars with charm and courtesy. Bonjour. Si. Okay. Okay. The Italian authorities, on the other hand, decide they want souvenirs. They've already collected 70 rally caps, but they still want more. Monsieur, monsieur, Malia. Qu'est-ce que c'est Maliette? As the car 
cars leave Souza on their way to Milan, great stories are beginning to emerge, like the president of Italian motorsport, Fabrizio Serena, in his Alfa Giulia, dicing with Anne Hall's Anglia and blowing up his engine in the process. Italian national pride is dented even deeper when the president discovers he won't make it to Monza at the start of day four. This is where the rally drivers will get the chance to do a timed lap of the Italian Grand Prix circuit, setting off at 30 second intervals. Two, one. still leads the marathon, but John Chatham in his big Healy isn't giving an inch. Francis spent all night hitchhiking 900 miles to replace their broken differential. They're out of the competition, but in the spirit of the event, the organizers have let them continue for the fun of it. The Japanese don't keep old cars like we do, so the 1966 model Honda has been painstakingly constructed from spare parts fresh from the factory in Japan. 72-year-old Peter Binns insists on wearing the correct line in tweeds, whatever the weather. But where's the regimental tie? Improperly dressed, sir. The youngest competitor, Paul Brace, bought his Porsche as a wreck for £2,000 and restored it himself. He's surprised to find himself in fifth place. The 1955 Alvis of Roland Simmons is making a great job of this difficult circuit. While Luca Grandori in his Alpha is patriotically redesigning it. A gambit not popular with the gentlemen of Her Majesty's Press. Taylor and his appropriately named co-driver Zoe Heritage are taking a cool approach to Monza, maybe because it's the start of a very long day, and they're heading for a good final placing. Away from the plains and the motorways, now the rally gets back up in the mountains where it really belongs. High up in the Alps lies one of the most feared stages in the Alpine rallies of the 1950s, an ancient goat track called the Croce Demoni, leading to the village of Bagolino. At least it has a bit of tarmac on it these days, but it's still a tough drive. Now the competitors are discovering what the organizers meant by the word marathon. Later, nearly at Cortina, there's a time control and a chance to catch up on repairs. Peter Bannum doesn't hesitate to help a competitor, least of all Anne Hall. These frequent selfless acts of helpfulness are going to win Peter the Spirit of the Rally Award. All the cars are feeling the pace. Damaged suspension, overheating engines and worn brakes head the list of ailments. 
you know, this is one of those things that are just wearing out as we're going on. We're just hoping it's going to keep on going. But unfortunately, if, our, if we've no brake pads, you know, we're really in trouble. Now, where's the damn stop there? But I'm enjoying it tremendously. But we had a, a real dice this morning to get to the control on time. Okay. I don't know. Mike Barker is in deep trouble. A core plug has blown out of the side of his Jaguar's engine behind the starter motor and the engine has shed two gallons of oil. He has a spare plug but he doesn't know if his engine bearings are ruined. The delay will cost him his Alpine Cup. Because of the diversity of the cars in sportiness as well as age, they've grouped them loosely into classes. The Dutchman and their 1952 MG are having better luck now and they're on their way to a class win. This is the kind of country the Healy's are best at. Tony Barranco and Kevin Law are racing down the hill towards Cortina in hot pursuit of a group of three Porsche 356s from Spain. The four of them have turned the event into a mini rally of their own. Cortina, defended by the great ramparts of the Dolomites, is a haven for exhausted rally drivers, just as it was in the great days of the 50s and 60s. This is as far away from the London start as the rally goes. To get here this fast in a modern car with disc brakes, four-wheel drive and modern fuel-injected engine would be a major feat. It's a tribute to the qualities of these classics and their drivers that no fewer than 87 of them have completed the first half of the marathon. But just as in any rally, it's taking its toll. Here's the second oldest conversation in rally. Where are we? It's Wednesday. Yes, and it's Cortina. This HRG of Tim Jackson stops actually competed in the 1948 Alpine. Now it's well ahead of many of the newer cars. Which is more than can be said for the other HRG in the marathon with an almost inconsolable Peter Binns at the wheel. And this is a parking ticket, you have to show it here in the way. Okay? Yes. Thank you. That's not something. Thank you very much. Mike Barker is triumphant, with some justification. He completed a major roadside repair on his engine with just a basic toolkit. The officials are full of admiration. Well, how much for What's coming at? 20, 29? Yes, yeah. so we've lost 55 minutes. Mm. But still in. That's oh, nice. Still in, we're in. More good motoring tomorrow. Yeah. Fortuna Hill will be nice. Right. And we'll see how this goes around auto tests, won't we? <laughs> I can just see you doing a handbrake <laughs> turn in this. It's going to be wonderful. OK. Well, OK. Well. Have a well earned rest, anyway. Alla vederci. Co-driver Chris Flavel and his partner in the 3.8 Jaguar on his way to join him are destined not to get the award for the best dressed crew. To make matters worse, they've modified the front suspension of their car so that it rides too high off the ground. When asked about the effect on the car's handling, they were forced to admit it's like a supermarket trolley. Three, four, get 
nel K2 del 1966. 93 si tratta di una Volvo 1200. The authorities of Cortina are proud to welcome these fabulous old cars. They've even closed the main street to allow the entire rally to park for the night. Bill Bengry, he of the London to Sydney exhaust pipe, has been having the time of his life. Bring back memories this does. Yeah, the liege and all that, you know. No brakes as usual. <laughs> We've had a hell of a time coming down that hill. Just the gearbox. Otherwise the car has been fantastic. Yeah, we have seen anything the wrong until the brakes backed up. Well, certainly the pads have come off. It's our own fault, really. We should have had him in the car instead of the service car. We can't find him. <laughs> this, has, this has happened before, though, isn't it? I think Ralph's just about ready for the night's sleep. He's wonderful, really. I mean, he's 80 years old. He's he's all right. Right. I think he'll survive. At the last check, at the last control, there's no disc pads on. And we did in the last stage on the gearbox. No brakes. And we made it with two minutes. That's not bad, you know. The attitude of the locals, we think, has been very good, considering that we've been held up a lot in traffic and had to make it up on the road, their attitude is excellent. Generally speaking, the camaraderie between the people involved is good, everybody stops. We stopped up the road when we thought somebody had an accident, there were lots of flashing lights, but two blokes got out because their backsides ached and it was the road work, so uh, generally speaking, OK. We're pleased with that. Looking forward to a meal and a bar. Day five starts with a climb of six miles from just outside Cortina to the Paso Giao. Mike Barker in his Jaguar once again leads the charge. Stokes have clearly had all the rest they needed. The last time Bill drove up this mountain, the road was a dirt track. Keith and Lynn Pettit are on their honeymoon. If their marriage survives this, it'll survive anything. And for the Lancia Spider, there's still a long way to climb as there is for a venerable Mercedes entered by two British soldiers based in Germany. The target speed up this steep climb is 32 miles an hour, too fast for an old Saab V4, and indeed for a six-cylinder Wolseley. Both are to lose their Alpine Cups because of this one climb. The spare parts from which the Honda replica has been constructed seem to be holding together well. Kumakura and Kobayashi are in 23rd place.
50s, the Sunbeam Rapier was the car to beat in these mountains. Now, it's showing its age. Chatham's Austin Healy is doing well, but at every stage it's just losing ground to its chief rival, the AC Cobra. 17 seconds slower up this long climb. Philip Edwards' Volvo 122S is running well too. Philip will get an Alpine Cup and finish in the top 20 places. Mike Barker's Jaguar is back on top form as it reaches the summit at 7,000 feet and the end of the special stage. Back on the outskirts of Cortina, there's a well-earned half day off, an opportunity to sightsee or, as proved necessary for most cars, make vital repairs before setting off on the second half of the marathon. Den Green was the mechanical wizard who built and cosseted countless BMC cars through the golden age of British rallying. When Healy's, Mini Coopers and MG's won, he was there behind the scenes, keeping them on the road. His role here is to offer his mechanical skill to any entrant who needs it, a sort of AA Superman. That's all right, young man, it could happen to anyone. I just happen to have the requisite article in the back of my van, just slot it in here. We'll have you back on the road in no time. That's it. Stop. Don't take it up. Don't take it up. All right. Okay. The young man who restored a Porsche from scratch and his co-driver are on their first ever rally. We started off the rally really just to have a cruise around. Got to, got to have a go around, meet at the end of the day, have a good social event. But almost unfortunately we, we put in a good time on the very first st section at Lydon. And um, of course once you've got one good time, you know, the pressure's on, competitive spirit builds up. We're all looking at each other's cars and, um, and that was it. We, we were fired up and off we go. We've actually put in some pretty decent times, which, which has amazed us. We're, um, we're half, half the horsepower of, of sort of other Porsches and we're, we're total underdogs. I mean, we're trying to play a rich man's game with absolutely no money. And um, it's a dream come true. It's a fantastic rally and um, we're, we're getting a lot out of it. And obviously we're over the moon and we've got to keep it up now. We've just got to keep going and going and going. The pressure's on. The most awe-inspiring stage of this colossal rally is the great Stelvio Pass. The cars will climb to a height of 9,000 feet through an arm-breaking 48 hairpin bends. Anne Hall must remember with some pain driving up this very pass on a Liège rally in a Ford Zephyr. So how will the cars of that era cope with the same gruelling climb today?
At 6,000 feet, the scenery just gets grander. Smales and Clements in their Jowett will have the home movie of a lifetime if their camera can take the punishment. Atkins and Lyle in their Cobra are still dominating the field. are still fighting for all they're worth. John Chatham is waiting for a chance to overhaul the Healy Silverstone and must be hoping that his rivals in the AC Cobra will make their first mistake. The rally cars like the Cortina and the Mini Cooper are still coping well with the altitude and lack of oxygen. Which is more than can be said for the poor old Morris Minor, virtually on its last gasp. Alfa Romeos, Jaguars, Triumphs, whining gears, straining engines, this really is turning into the great chase. In an action-packed 15 minutes, the cars have climbed the nine miles from the forest to above the snow line and changed gear a hundred times. Push it, push it, please, the clutch is on the way. Off you go. Right. Wait a minute, wait. Quickly, please, Jack, we've got three minutes. That's your start time. The, the Anglia of Vic Ryland and Bob Lyons has a third crew member, Mrs. Ryland, cooped up in the back. During the rally, she'll have knitted an entire jumper for her husband. The toughest stage is over. The convoy now heads back to London. Almost immediately, Bengri and Stokes are in trouble. A minor navigational error has them climbing the Stelvio Pass again, but from the other side. The time penalties leave them well down the field in 75th place. The Honda, in spite of having the smallest engine in the event, finishes in 30th position. Mike Sutcliffe now has a second Alpine Cup to add to his collection. He and Roy Dixon finish 14th. Paul Brace and Ashley Briston, the poor youngsters playing a rich man's game, finish in an astonishing sixth position and also take home an Alpine Cup. John Chatham and Ken Bartram have tried everything they know short of sabotage to get past that slippery cobra, but they have to settle for a defiant second place by only 39 seconds after the final stage at Crystal Palace. The Bannums not only won the Spirit of the Rally Award for their helpfulness, they took an Alpine Cup to go with it. We still don't know what's in the back of that Anglia with Mrs. Ryland to weigh it down like that. They finish in 69th place. 
In the other Anglia, Anne Hall and Val Morley, impeccable to the end, have overcome huge mechanical problems with their car, and they qualify for yet another Coupe des Dames. And the best dressed award goes to the MG Magnet pair, Mark Beckley and Stephen Thorning. The firm who hired them the suits may never know they were used for rallying. Luca Grandori waited till the very last stage of this two and a half thousand mile rally to take third place by only one second from Peter Tyson in a Porsche. In the end, there's no substitute for raw power. The ferocious AC Cobra has led from start to finish, and the overall prize goes to John Atkins and Rob Lyle. But few will argue that the real victors are the 86 fabulous old cars which have somehow managed to finish the biggest classic car event Europe has ever seen.